We're continuing in our sermon series through the Sermon on the Mount, and we are to chapter 7. I think we're really going to make it through it, y'all. The Sermon on the Mount is the longest single section of teaching from Jesus, where he just begins speaking and doesn't stop speaking. It's the largest section in the New Testament where that happens. Matthew chapter 5, 6, and today we are picking up in chapter 7. The Sermon on the Mount is essential to the Christian faith because of what it represents are all of the principles of God's heavenly kingdom. The kingdom of heaven, as it's described in Matthew, and another gospel sometimes called the kingdom of God, those are synonyms. That the kingdom of heaven and the way its citizens live is totally contrary to the way every kingdom on earth works. And I don't just mean geopolitical governments and kingdoms, but the way that fallen man operates ever since sin ever since corruption set in, in the garden, at Adam's rebellion, which has been visited upon all of us, and we prove ourselves to be his biological children when we sin, that the systems that exist within our hearts and minds, which have been damaged by sin, say, I'm going to look out for number one. I'm going to get what I can get. If someone wrongs me, I'm going to wrong them right back, at least in equal measure, maybe some multiple that I have predetermined. And if they're kind to me, maybe I'll be kind to them. All of that is conditional. And God's kingdom is completely the opposite. It says that those who participate in God's kingdom must come to him lowly and poor in spirit. That they must recognize that they have nothing to offer, nothing to contribute, nothing to, nothing to earn their citizenship within God's kingdom. They must also come to him poor in spirit, recognizing that our entrance is only by his grace and by his mercy. We must extend mercy not because, not only if and when we get it, but because God has shown it to us. We show it to others. We must be peacemakers. Then there are certain sins that even from the law of Moses, we knew we weren't supposed to do. However, it is far more challenging than we recognized in the law of Moses. It's far more challenging than even the Pharisees who try to multiply the, the uh, difficulty. And Jesus explains that perfection far exceeds what you are even expecting. That there are sins that take place even in our heart. We say, well, I've never murdered anyone. Unrighteous anger against your brother and sister in Christ is not equally as wicked in terms of if we were going to bring you up on charges in court, but it equally separates you from God and it is equally sin. Then he says, not only that, but righteous living, righteous behavior, doing acts of, of, of righteousness, like giving to the poor, praying, fasting, and a number of others that aren't even listed, that those things are not done in order to get the attention and accolades of our, of our brothers and sisters. That's not a spectator sport. And then Jesus comes to chapter 7. That was a pretty quick uh, review of what Jesus has covered so far in, cha in chapters 5 and 6. And then at the beginning of chapter 7, and it is my opinion that he wants to, he wants to inoculate against two possible and frequent errors of religiosity, people who consider themselves righteous that they might fall into when they're like, okay, I'm about this kingdom business. This is what I want to do. And those two things are self-righteousness and false righteousness, which there's a ton of overlap too. But just, so, just to clarify, there are some people, like the Pharisees, for example, who from a certain perspective were not disobeying the cleanliness laws or the dietary laws of the law of Moses, they had something objective to point to. But their thought was, and that makes me better than all of you. They would literally pray just like that. Um, it, it, there's a parable in, it's at least in Matthew 18, and it, I think it is also uh, spoken of in other gospels. We call it the parable of the Pharisee and the publican, uh, if you're uh, King James, the publican, if you're nasty, right? <laughs> and the Pharisee and the tax collector. Pharisee gets up there and he says, Lord, thank you that I'm righteous and not like this bum at self-righteousness. Whereas the tax collector standing off to the side says, Lord, uh, I know my sin. I know that I don't deserve to interact with you or have a relationship with you. That is the kind of humility, the kind of poor in spirit that kingdom citizens are expected. So we're about to take a look at what Jesus has to say about these two possible responses to all of this kingdom instruction that he's been giving us. Let's start in chapter 7, verse 1. Jesus says, judge not that you be not judged. We're going to go right to verse 2 before I break this down. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, 
it will be measured to you. Let's stay there on verse two, but I want to explain a little something that was taking place in verse one. This is one of the most used and abused verses of the New Testament by the secular world. People who, for the most part, don't care at all what Jesus says about loving your neighbor or about righteous living or about sin and righteousness. They don't care at all about that, but they do want to say, you can't judge me. The Bible says judge not. And I'm always like, uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> It says, it says, judge not, lest you be judged, for the judgment you pronounce will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. There is actually no way in which, as a blanket statement, it says there is no judging to be taking place. Because the moment you notice someone is judging you, what have you just done? You have judged them to be a judger, <laughs> it is a, it is a, it would be logically inconsistent for that to be what it means. But it reveals just in the next several verses that can't possibly be what he means, as we're about to see. But I want to point out to you that the difference, the challenge exists mostly in English. Where judge, that word has to pull double, triple, quadruple duty within our language. There is, let's just, let's just take a legal uh, setting, for example. I actually just got a jury summons. Never had it in my entire life. I wonder if I'll be selected uh, when I indicate I'm a pastor. And like, I wonder how many defense attorneys are like, this uh, free pass, this guy can go. We'll see. We'll see what winds up happening. Uh, I'm interested in going. Within our legal system, there is a jury, right, in certain criminal instances. Their job is to judge, is to assess, is to analyze the likelihood and the validity of the evidence provided. They say, I got to tell you, it really looks like this guy did it. Or they say, you know what? Having looked at this, I'm not really sure that it's clear that, that this guy or this gal did it. There is an assessment. But then let's say that their assessment is this was wrong and it was bad. And that is their, that is their judgment. Who is it who pronounces judgment? The judge. Those are two different things. But the same word winds up having to pull that duty. In God's word, it is, his, it is his universal witness that it is not for us to pronounce judgment, to levy a sentence. That belongs only to the Lord. But it is a loving act for us to look in primarily to our own lives and then to our brothers and sisters' lives. And in an, on another way, as we're about to see, as Jesus explains, even to look out into the world and at least explain to one another, maybe explain to the world if they're receptive to hearing, uh, that isn't what God has planned. I know Jesus, and I was in the same place that you were. And I am making an assessment that what you're doing, it dishonors him, it hurts you, it's bad for everyone around. I love you, and I don't want you to do it. Stop judging me! Oh, man. <laughs> With that said, though, it should never be our, it is not within our prerogative to see sin and say, now that person's going to hell. But for the grace of God, we all are destined for hell. The sentence was commuted. The guilt that we have upon us, our assessment is that we are guilty. God's word says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's Romans 3.23. And Romans 6.23 says the wages of that sin, what that sin earns is death. And there's just no way around it. But God, the judge... The judge who pronounces sentence, he looks to Jesus, our advocate, and the Holy Spirit. And this was their plan from before time began. What are we going to do? We love these people even though they hate us, even though they've sinned against us. It's our, it's our desire to redeem them. Jesus, God the Son, says, I will take the judgment. We assess, they assess. Romans says that even the fallen world who doesn't know God at all, they know on a certain level the macro things that are right and the macro things that are wrong. We see it even in secular laws and in other worldviews and world religions. The problem is that apart from Jesus, we cannot flawlessly follow a moral standard. Jesus says, well, the judgment has to be pronounced, but I'll take it on myself. God the Father, judge who pronounces judgment, pronounced their judgment on me, and he took it upon himself on the cross. So there is no judgment, there is no condemnation, there is no guilty verdict that believers levy against anyone. 
least of all against one another, when we know if you've placed your faith in Jesus, you have been pronounced innocent, not because you are or were innocent, but because he has already paid your penalty. However, we are required to judge. We are required to assess. We are required to examine ourselves. Otherwise, how would we know if we were following the Beatitudes? How would I know if I am or am not being merciful? How would I know if I am or, not a, am or am not a peacekeeper or poor in spirit? I need to make a personal assessment. For those of us who have relationship in Christ Jesus, particularly those of you who are in close relationship, family, close friends, crews are a great place for this sort of interpersonal loving assessment to take place. That is what is being spoken of here. Be careful even how you make assessment. Verse 2 for the judgment, for the assessment, for the analysis that you pronounce, it will be judged to you. Oftentimes I like to boil these things down to the most simple picture that I can. And for me, it has to do with my kids. They are wonderful kids. Wow, how blessed I am that God has given me these three beautiful children and that Rachel has brought them to me. I love them and her so much. Sometimes they will make a mistake. Sometimes it's even a deliberate disobedience, although that is, that's pretty uncommon. Sometimes it'll just be an error. And me in my flesh will flip out. And then I'll think, Nathan, first of all, they're kids. Oftentimes they didn't mean to do that. Even if they did mean to do it, how would you want your father in heaven to respond to you when I am in error? taking that up to maybe one level higher and a little bit more complicated because I do have ultimate authority or I, I, do, I do have uh, final authority over my earthly children. But what about when we have an interpersonal relationship and there's someone within your life, someone within your family, someone within your friends who knows Jesus, who is a kingdom citizen and you assess, you analyze there's something in their life that is not right. Is the answer to throw on a spiritual silent, woo, 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 and tell everybody else about it? That's not the way. We, we're, we're told elsewhere in scripture that that's not the way. Or do we go to them lovingly and gently, but courageously and clearly, and say, ah, I got to tell you, in the flesh, I would rather not even be talking to you about this. But I love you too much to overlook it. There's this thing I'm seeing taking place in your life, and it's not God's plan. They might sting you for it. Even brothers and sisters in Christ might sting you for it. But that is the kind of judgment that is being talked about here. He says, judge not, in verse 1. In Greek, the, it, it, it's quite clear that uh, the tenses, they, get a, they can get a little bit confused. The idea is, you guys have been judging in an inappropriate way. You need to stop. Who was he primarily talking to? I don't know if I've, don't answer that. I, I don't know if I've given you enough forewarning. I've said in multiple sermons, the Pharisees are right there. So what it lands on is everybody, look at it, you Pharisees, you need to stop levying these assessments and in the case of the Pharisees, sometimes these, these uh, sentences against one another, you're not the judge. Only God is judge. James 2, 13, not on the screen. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. That when we're interacting with brothers and sisters in Christ, our judgment is one of awareness and one to point it out, one to shine a light privately, not shine a spotlight for everyone to see, but so that that person can recognize to help tap on their shoulder. The Holy Spirit, I'm sure, has been convicting you about this. I want you to know that I love you. We can work on this together. That becomes necessary. But if our judgment, our assessment is done gleefully or to embarrass, that is unbecoming of God's kingdom citizens. Let's take a look. <laughs> at an awesome analogy that Jesus uh, uses starting in verse 3. He says, why do you see the speck, as the English Standard Version, ESV, that's what I'm reading today, says, that's in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, hey man, that's not in God's word, that was, a, that was, <laughs> that was Nathan getting into character. <laughs> Let me take the speck out of your eye when there's a log in your own eye. What was Jesus's profession 
uh, before starting his earthly ministry. Carpenter. I believe that he knew about specks and he knew about logs. Just to let you know, this word spec, um, by today's standards, probably the most useful thing for us to think of would be sawdust. In other parts of ancient Greek literature, uh, this word gets used for material that a bird would use to fluff their nest. We're talking small. We're talking fluffy. We're talking light. We're talking something that could float in and it could get in your eye. Pastor Mike, does it ever get in your eye, right? When you're milling or when you're doing woodwork, anybody else? Absolutely. But Jesus also indicates, but you have a, what, what did the English standard say? You have a log. Maybe if you're following along in your Bible, some of the others might say a beam or a board. I don't think any uh, translations say this, but I looked up in some, uh, uh, some lexicon, that's like a, a dictionary for other languages, and it said girder. I think by our standard, we could think railroad tie. I'm going to use this as an undersized example. He says, you notice that your brother has a speck of sawdust in their eye. You're like, hey, man, let me help you with that, right? I'm going to come and just hold still, right? <laughs> the funny thing is, how could a log be in our eye? This is something that exists in Near East, uh, in, which includes Israel, um, wisdom literature. It's an exaggeration, but only in the physical. It is not an exaggeration in the spiritual realm. That's the beauty of it. Jesus has already used it. I think this was in chapter, I'm almost certain it was in chapter five. He said, if your eye causes you to sin, what should you do? Gouge it out. I've never seen anyone do that, and I don't actually think he's telling you. The physical is an exaggeration, but it is an understatement in the spiritual. That's how serious it is. So, thank the Lord, our eyes are small and logs are big, and you know I'd be more likely to have a black eye than have a log in my eye, but in my spirit? I can be so unaware of something this large or larger and still act like I'm prepared to do, what are, what are eye doctors called? Ophthalmologists? To, do, to, to perform spiritual ophthalmology on you. That's what he's talking about. It is a hilarious and ridiculous physical image, but it is an ever-present and real spiritual lived experience. And he says it should not be this way. He goes on, in verse 5, to explain it in plainer language. You hypocrite. First, take the log. Man, I thought I'd get a better. That was more of like a slop. I wanted a click. Uh, uh, Wyatt, Wyatt, make that loud noise with your tongue. Can you do it? That's what I, that's what I, was, that's what I was That's what I was going for, and it just sounded like, I was like, oh, that was rated PG-13. <laughs> sorry, sorry about that. Take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. This is where it becomes clear as day. We are needed to assess, to analyze, in a certain sense, to judge one another. Say, you may not notice it, man, but there's a speck in your eye. It's going to hurt you if it goes unnoticed. Trust me, I've had experience with specks of this nature before. I've had a log of this same species. I might be pushing the analogy too far. But I know about extracting this because I've had to do it for myself. This word hypocrite, it is, it is a wild and interesting word. And I actually think it is, it is one of the... It is, a, it is a wicked character trait that the entire world agrees is wrong. They might disagree with you about all kinds of things about righteousness. No one likes hypocrisy. It's amazing. Thus far, there has been no way for the enemy to glorify this characteristic. He's glorified all kinds of vile things as we experience. Everyone universally agrees hip hypocrisy is bad. And the, another interesting thing, the Greek word looks exactly like the English word with just a slight different pronunciation. So we, this word has been so intensely used that it has survived through Greek all the way into English. It's a compound word. The second half of it, Chrissy, comes from Krino, which was what it said, don't judge. And then the hypo, what is it? Where's Rachel? Hypo means low, right? Like hypoglycemia, not enough sugar. And then hyper is like, when I've had too many popsicles or something like that, right? So what it means is to make judgment while you are under cover. It's a theatrical term. You know, uh, in certain old-timey or very high art theaters, there's that smiley face and that frowny face. 
The idea is that there's a mask hiding who you really are. And in the theater, that's fun. In real life, it's awful. A hypocrite wears a mask that says, I'm all, I'm all good, and I notice how bad you are. Problem is, if you're a hypocrite with a log in your eye, even if you're trying to, even if you're trying to wear, I like stickers. <laughs> even if you're trying to wear a mask, everyone's like, yeah, that guy's hiding something. <laughs> He's like, nah, uh my face is good. My face is clean. No, bro, you are, do not come over here and try to take the speck out of my eye. Jesus says, you hypocrite. This goes back once again to this concept of judgment is necessary. Assessment is necessary. Remember, a sentence is only, that only belongs to the Lord. Vengeance belongs to the Lord. People's final destination, only the Lord is aware because he knows what is going on in man's heart. But an assessment, an analysis, a recommendation, a correction, a loving, loving discipline, that's to be expected between brothers and sisters in Christ. But it should start between us and the Holy Spirit for ourselves. What this is also not saying is that you're not allowed to correct someone else unless you have complete mastery over the issue that they're facing. That's not what that means. I got to tell you. <clears throat> While I do think that that is hypothetically and theologically and literally possible, I don't actually think that it has ever been actual, save for Christ Jesus. Which is why the Lord has delivered me from a variety of habitual pitfall sins. Ones that through high school and college, I thought, there's no conquering this. I'll never be able to get over this. And you know what? I was right. Nathan could not get over it. The Holy Spirit and Christ Jesus in Nathan could and has. But even now, because he's the one who conquered it, I don't walk, I don't walk in the face of those temptations like, oh, I got this. I walk like, Jesus, you got this, right? I want to stay away from that thing. I want to flee that temptation. I know that in you, I have victory. I have victory for eternity, having been forgiven by you, but I can have daily victory so long as it's you who's fighting for me and in me and through me. So what that means is, when you see someone struggling with something you've struggled with before, the first question is to make an analysis. Am I struggling with it right now in a hypocritical way? Am I wearing a mask to shield it? Then maybe I'm not in position in order to help that person. That's why our uh, call to worship was from Galatians 6.1. Brothers and sisters, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Hey man, I noticed this thing in your life. If you hold still, we can work on this together and we can remove it through the power of the Holy Spirit. Do it with gentleness, but keep watch on yourself lest you be tempted. But if it's the case that, you like, that you're able to say, brother, sister, I know what it is that you're going through. I've struggled with that myself. Matter of fact, if it weren't for the fact that the Holy Spirit has this in a headlock, I'd be struggling with it right now. But together, we can work on this. We can... We can prayerfully, together, give this to the Lord. We can check on one another and encourage one another so that Jesus, who already has victory over all sin, can have victory over this sin in your life. Would you like to do that with me? That's judgment. That is loving judgment. Let's not be hypocrites. Let's not disregard or not notice logs within our own eye. But let's not submit to the world's false interpretation of this text that no judgment ever is allowed, which would be a judgment. And then there's verse 6, which if you're reading along in your Bible, is probably a new paragraph. And there's actually some debate or discussion among scholars about the unity of this final chapter. Uh, I actually think that our confusion sometimes when reading the Sermon on the Mount or the book of James, or others, where it seems like some of the ideas ping pong around, I actually think that in many ways, the ancients were able to hold a train of thought in a, in a stronger, longer, more interesting way than maybe at least I can, having grown up in the digital age. My thoughts are very linear, and I want one thing to the next. That's why whenever I'm having a conversation with Miss Paula or Pastor Clayton about some sort of financial issue in the church, I gotta be like Michael Scott. Explain it to me like I'm 10. And then they do, and I say, Again, like I'm five. <laughs> but, but, but I actually think that if we slow down, we can see why, this, why verse 6 belongs right here. Let's take a look. 
no more speck, no more judgment. He, he doesn't say it, but how does it relate to this next thing he's about to say? Do not give dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. I meant to indicate this earlier, but that's two times already within the verses that we've assessed that he's used a Hebrew proverb structure. It's parallelism. Don't give to dogs what is holy or pearls to swine. A, B, B, A, and it intensified. At least for me, uh, pigs are yuckier than dogs. Although in the ancient world, they were nearly equally yucky. <laughs> right? It's not a compliment. When he says don't give to dogs what is holy, have you guys ever been over to Pastor Doug and Miss Connie's house? That, that dog lives like a king. <laughs> My mom is not doing anything inappropriate. Maybe from a, maybe from a, um, what, what's a doctor for animals? From a veterinarian perspective, perhaps. <laughs> but not from a spiritual perspective. She loves her dog. These are not the groomed, lovely dogs that we have domesticated. That didn't exist in the Near East. Certainly not amongst Jewish people. He is talking about a filthy mongrel who eats disgusting things you guys remember in proverbs what dogs return to and that sort of thing you can look that up later if you don't know what it is that i'm talking about these are not compliments and they're analogies he's talking about people dogs and hogs it's like whoa this was just a minute ago i thought we were told not to judge well obviously we need to make an assessment otherwise how we how would we know if we were giving what is holy to people who are dog-like, or casting our pearls, what does that mean, before swine-like people? Now, I got to tell you, there is also debate as to what the pearls are, and the whole, the whole crux of it hangs on what that means. The interpretation can, it can vary widely based on what we think. I do not think that the pearls being spoken about here are the gospel, but I, I will tell you, though, multiple scholarly and trustworthy sources did did say so so maybe you need to wrestle with that i'll tell you the reasons i don't think so though number one this is a more subjective one if it weren't don't cast your pearls the gospel before swine or dogs or whatever that may mean maybe a pig or what do the pigs do they trample it underfoot and then they might hurt you if it meant the gospel what that would mean is you ever share the gospel with someone and they disregard it and then they make fun of you for it that sort of fits the analogy, right? The fact of the matter is, though, if there's somebody I love, I'm not going to stop trying. If I'm out there doing um, what I like to call spontaneous evangelism, in the literature it might be called confrontational evangelism. I don't like that phrase. It's like, here, let's fight about Jesus. That sounds like a confrontation. What it means is, hey, how are you doing? Is there any, can I pray with you? I used to do this uh, on prayer walk. I should pick it up again, as a matter of fact. I've got to find a new fishing hole, as it were. Um, is there anything I could pray for you about? Oftentimes people say, yeah. Sometimes they're a little put off because it's weird. <laughs> but I don't mind being weird for Jesus. Then at the end of that, it's like, do you know Jesus? Whatever it is that we just prayed about, he can take care of it. That's why I prayed in Jesus' name. Sometimes they want to talk about it. Sometimes they don't. But even if they were to hurt me or, or, or insult me or disregard me, I probably just won't see that person again. But if it were my kids or somebody that I love and I treasure, maybe I won't get beat up repeatedly. If they, if they got me up, I'll recognize... They're not, they're not against me. They haven't rejected me. They're rejecting Jesus. But I'm going to circle back and try again until I run out of opportunities, at least with people I love. So that was the most subjective. Possibly that's what's being talked about. Here are some more objective reasons. Number one, it says pearls. Up. So there's a plurality. The gospel's the gospel. Maybe you consider this thin. I thought it would be don't throw your pearl before swine. There's one gospel but I've got lots of pearls. Jesus has been sharing lots of pearls, kingdom principles with us. We're starting to get to what I think is going on here. Uh, and then the, um, I thought I had one more. Pearls. Yeah, pearls is the context, so uh, here we are. I think that everything that Jesus has been sharing in the Sermon on the Mount are the pearls that we should be cautious whether or not we give to Dirty dog like people, and not, you dirty dog. No, not like that. Right? People who might be dangerous. And here's the reason. Those who are not spiritual, those who are not citizens of God's kingdom, none of this will make any sense. For those of us who are spiritual and who are, who are 
recent naturalized citizens of God's kingdom, I remember what it was like to live in the world. And sometimes, unless I submit to the spirit, it doesn't always make sense to me. So when I come and I tell somebody, hey man, blessed are the poor in spirit. He's like, I don't know what you're talking about. Get away from me. If I go to someone and I explain, look, you wronged me and that hurt me, but I'm going to forgive you. They say, I don't care. Stick around. I'll hurt you again. I think that's what's being talked about by pearls before swine. What is holy to dogs? I think an assessment, a judgment needs to be made about the fallen non-spiritual world and maybe even brothers and sisters in Christ who are not exhibiting kingdom characteristics that you want to come to them and you think, hey, we're, we're, we're working from the same script. We both, we both call Jesus our savior, perhaps, or maybe in the fallen world they don't, but they seem like a decent person. And we want to start discussing and parsing the particulars about what it means in God's kingdom. There are people who don't care and what's more might ridicule you or hurt you for it. I think that's what's being talked about here. And that's part of why I think it fits in this analysis of judgment, which is totally necessary. We need to assess ourselves. We need to lovingly keep an eye on one another for our good. All discipline in the New Testament is restorative. All discipline within the church, if and when it ever needs to take place, and it's my least favorite part about being a pastor, but it sometimes becomes necessary. Even then, it is loving and restorative to get us back into a position of right relationship with God and full right relationship within his body, the church. But if a person isn't having it, and they would sooner sting you or hurt the body for it, we need to make an assessment and say, I guess that's that for now. Brothers and sisters, my only fear is that I, have over, is that I may have overstated in the explanation and the clarity how important it is not to be judgmental, to pass judgment. There are a few things that will drive people away from the gospel faster than hypocrisy, self-righteousness, or false righteousness. But in my opinion, there are a few things that we can do that are more attractive than to live these kingdom principles with humility and sincerity and love. And when they see the way that we've got each other's backs, even when it comes to indicating, hey man, that isn't what God has planned for you. Maybe together we can improve this. Maybe together we can fix this. Maybe together we can both submit even more to the influence of the power of the Holy Spirit. That is when the world will have no accusation against us and actually begin to say, how can I get some of that? What is this kingdom you've been talking about and how do I become a citizen?